yeah, first, thanks, Anna and Sebastian, to joining us. So, and to everybody else, I'm just going to very briefly and lightly touch on, on Anna and Sebastian, which are running CREAM, a name which I hope to hear more about. Um, so, CREAM, as you probably read from the description, is a digital art studio based in London with the focus on game engine technology. So, there is a lot of real-time content and a lot of world building and digital content creation involved in, in your guys' work. And why I'm really excited to see you too and to hear about what you're doing is having the ability to, to introduce a very young student. And I really love this. I really love like the effervescence chance and you know the flexibility a young studio will have, especially the enthusiasm that you guys at Cream have. Uh, and I also find super exciting the way you guys work with artists, designers, you know, creative research agencies, which I find even more than any other kind of framework of, uh, of work. So I don't want to, you know, further detail of who's coming where from. I think it would really be great to start talking about the work and to keep the conversation open. Uh, so I can, and I'll pass it to you. The only thing I want to mention before that is that I would like to introduce you as a studio and not as a startup, as we were introduced a couple of years ago when uh, I was running Universal Assembly Unit with Sammy and, and Will uh, and Zan as well. So. I, yeah, I don't believe in startups. I think it's a it's a great, exciting studio what you guys are doing, and uh, I'll leave it to you to show us more about that. Cool. Thank yeah. you, Ali. So yeah, thanks, um, Ali Manje, for the invitation. Um, we are not a startup. I will just uh, say that again. Um, but today we wanted to kind of share the first year of the studio. Um, and talk about projects that we're doing or did recently, but kind of direct the conversation, let's say outside this issue of immersion, uh, meaning that we'll talk a lot about what happened behind the screen, um, whether the way, whether it is the way we kind of built up the projects or kind of wider issues that kind of talk about the challenges, the complications, but also the opportunities to, um, that arise in the making of you know, immersive digital projects today, especially as a tiny, tiny studio. So it's also the first time we're kind of formally sharing this work. So thank you for giving us the space. Um, so I guess you already introduced Cream, but again, to reiterate, we work with other visual artists, designers, and research agencies. And we create still or moving images or kind of wider involved um, immersive projects. And we do this by borrowing workflows and techniques that are primarily developed by the gaming industry and then kind of reappropriate them um, for the kind of cultural arts pro um, projects. So that being said, our references come from the fields of architecture, because obviously that's our background, but also media art and most importantly, photography and cinema, um, which in the work that we do then meet with kind of heavily scripted, complex visual tools um, and technologies. So the first project we'll share is a computer generated window view commissioned by Superflux for their installation mitigation of shock. It was exhibited last year at the Art Science Museum in Singapore as part of the exhibition 2020, uh, sorry, 2219 Futures Imagine, which, event, uh, which invites visitors to explore a world as it changes over the next 200 years. So this is an installation view photographed in the space of the museum. What Superflux did here is to imagine a future where climate change has significantly shifted the way we relate to the city and in turn, uh, and in turn, the way in which we inhabit our domestic spaces. What you see through the window is our contribution to the space, which is a fictional view overlooking a main boulevard in Singapore, approximately 50 years from now. As you can see, the city has now seen rising water levels, and as a way of adapting, new infrastructures have been built from solar panels, water tanks, and wind turbines. On the ground level, a whole new level of system transportation has been implemented, as well as new modes of inhabitation. So let's just pause here and um, watch this for a little bit more. We 
we wanted to talk about this project mainly through the lens of the, the image, which was given to us by Superflux, as it shows the current condition of the boulevard. The, the task became to imagine, a, the, the task was to imagine a world on top of this image, to build a replica of it in digital space, but to recontextualize it in a different time and reshoot it with a different lens. To contextualize this process, we wanted to talk a little bit about Jeff Wall and his image, A Sudden Gust of Wind after Hokusai from 1993. What you see here is a reconstruction of a woodcut by Katsushika Hokusai from 1832 called Travelers Caught in a Sudden Breeze at Ijiri. Initially trained as a painter in the early 1990s, Wall began to use digital manipulation to collage photographic constituents. Collaging elements from a range of sources was a standard practice in the making of classical painting. For Wall, applying this technique to photographic material was a process akin to cinematography or a new type of camera or lens. But contrary to the first appearances, Jeff's, Jeff Wall's work shown here was not a moment of still, uh, was not a moment in time. To take the work, Wall photographed actors over a period of five months in a landscape outside his hometown, Vancouver, at times when similar weather conditions prevailed. He then collaged elements of the photograph digitally in order to achieve the desired composition. The main purpose was to plot out the position and sizes of papers blowing in the air. He took individual pieces from various original scans, copied them and stuck them on the paper, changing them around to make the composition of the sky. This took quite a while and the small pieces were moved around repeatedly. Each has a code number so he could trace them back to the sheet of film. So the collage was really a working element in making the picture. Following this history, a new kind of shift can be argued to have happened in the making of computer generated images. And much of Wall's process had mutated once more in the making of this Singapore image. Working from the image we've shown before, we worked with techniques of camera mapping where a new camera attempts to align to the original camera with which the original image was shot. Similar to Wall's codification of the papers flying through the wind, the codification happens in the background by means of algorithmic processes. And similar to the subjects shot by Wall in his hometown for over five months, the objects added here on top of a now captured original image are sourced from the same codified world with only one type of weather, the pool of endless 3D models that live on open source platforms ready to be downloaded and collaged into a new scene. Contrary, however, to Jeff Wall's translation from woodcut to photograph, here we have moved from photograph to a 3D world. The translation lives through the states from wireframe to a white paper like sculpture to a final scene with its own space and time dimensions stuck on a loop where contrary to reality, there is no wind, only the one blown from the scripted wind machine. So the second project we'll show is also done in collaboration with Superflux. Um, unfortunately, we cannot share the specific details around it um, as, it is, uh, as it will be exhibited in a forthcoming um, exhibition. Um, next year. But similarly to what we have produced for Singapore, our contribution is a view through a city ravaged by climate change. Um, but contrary to the ways in which we worked with the Singapore view, we didn't start from a photograph, um, but we're pushed instead to build a whole world from scratch um, using a gaming engine called Unreal Engine. Um, in this case, this world is here for its inhabitants and they are stuck on this kind of scripted loop again. Um, and we very much felt that, you know, these characters in this world has been directed by us like characters in a film. Um, and we wanted to talk uh, again about the camera in this case um, as a way of considering the thresholds of digital worlds um, as they disintegrate into nothingness and, you know, the reality of this world where, you know, a reality that is kind of only complete um, when seen through the lens of this new type of camera. Um, and we also want to relate this process to the relationship between the filmmaker um, 
with the image. Um, if in you know reality, reality, the camera pursues and the filmmaker follows it. Um, in the digital world, you know the camera it's is the one that in itself makes and remakes reality over and over again. So we want to show an excerpt from a film called The Girl um, Chewing Gum. It is a film where John Smith exposes the work of the director as the subject of the film. But instead of showing himself in control of a large set um, and group of actors, he narrates the, the comings and goings of the public on a kind of everyday street scene, I think somewhere in Hackney. Um, first appearing to instruct them, then describing their movements. So I'm just gonna play this and hopefully it'll work. Slowly move the trailer to the left, and I want the little girl to run across now. Hold that trailer there. Now move the trailer off. Right, now I want the old man with white hair and glasses to cross the road. Come on, quickly. This way, now we'll pop to the bed. Okay, fine. Now let's have the man in the pink cap. Put the cigarette in your mouth. Good. And I want the two girls coming from the right talking to each other. So if in John Smith's film, the authority of the image, let's say, is questioned as a kind of recorded narrative stuck between kind of the reality of everyday life and the spoken commands of the director, of the filmmaker, in our game world, reality, as we said, is prototyped. We literally script as filmmakers. So the image is controlled, reassembled, recomposed again and again and again. And again, and again, and again, until reality kind of falls in place and then is taken over by an algorithmically programmed storm. So the third project we wanted to show um, was commissioned by Limbic Theatre um, and it's called Fatherland. It was developed in close partnership with Portsmouth University as part of the Creative XR program, an initiative by Digital Catapult and Arts Council. So Fatherland by Limbic is an interactive theater experience that uses real-time motion capture and VR technology to bring to life the journey of a son and a father coming to terms with dementia and disembodiment in a modern world. Our role in this project was quite interesting and particular. I guess we can call it post art direction. We we're invited to join the project at a time where the complexities of the technical requirements of the full motion capture VR live theater had already been dealt with by a team of programmers and game developers. Yet the visual quality of the experience had been left aside. Our role was to intervene in the existing project file built in Unreal Engine and work through the environments and reimagine the look and feel of the visual material. The technical setup of the project was incredibly complicated. It involved a player character in a motion capture suit, three or more VR headsets worn by the audience, two gaming computers, each linked to the streams from the motion capture and VR headsets respectively, a dense Unreal Engine project built as a multiverse of overlapping levels, a back-end control interface directed live by what we call the DJ, who was streaming the particular levels in and out of the Unreal file, and a local server where all this information was being constantly so uh, stored and reconfigured. We entered the project at a moment when resolution clashed with the limits, um, the limitations of these so-called emerging technologies, where performance clashed with aesthetics. So in this particular project, we had to become, we had to work between a, a constant push and pull between what we now call the limits of too much tech. 
and the possibilities of immersive image making. And even with our careful threading of this border, the effects of too much tech still creeped up on us in a real life reminder that immersion through a full body upload is something that should be considered really carefully. And maybe that the making of a heavily technological um, influence project should start from a careful distrust in the potential of emerging technologies rather than the blind belief in its so-called endless potential. So um, the fourth project we're showing is called Song.World. It's a project um, imagined by Sammy Lee and MJ Harding. Um, it's been an ongoing project for the last six months in collaboration with Sammy and Mikey. Um, our role in this project has been to develop the complete visual production of the world that is song. Um, a world where the global phenomena of K-pop is explored through notions of dismemberment and militarization. So since the project is ongoing and closely tied to funding streams and NDAs, we don't want to give away too much yet. But the project is designed to be a 360 live stream from a gaming engine, and it will at some point become a kind of full immersive installation in the future. So what you see here is an unfolded capture of this 360 live stream from Unreal Engine, implemented with an amazing plugin developed by Offworld Live. And you can see here the K-pop dancer translated from a real life dancer in a mocap suit. We actually, well, we actually wanted to use this project today to talk about the a very important relationship between institutional support and creativity, um, particularly in the case of projects that use immer immersive technologies. In no way this is a critique, but it's simply something that we've experienced. Um, our biggest challenge in the project has been to work through this kind of really weird balance between um, responding to the kind of institutional powers and kind of maintaining our own creative process. So it required to work between a really kind of structured, rigid, productive environment mm -hmm. that has this kind of own, its own clean, positive aesthetics and the messiness and incompleteness and insecurities that arrive in a kind of vague experimental process. So the visuals, you know, they reflect on, but don't adhere to the kind of stricted, you know, um, relations inevitably imposed by our funders into our team, but also, you know, the scripted ways of working the game engines and emerging technologies push us to work through, you know, where everything is perfectly planned through a production schedule and where the word kind of logic scheme is inevitably at the center of this creative process. So we wanted to discover the project through uncertainty, through mistakes, and most importantly, in a constant mind merge between us as creative individuals working together on a project. So we started to work differently from visual experiments without a specific goal, but as a way to open up to each other um, and to the project in a much more fluid way. So through this balance between the mentors and institutions we have to respond to and our own messy process, the project kind of took an unexpected turn, which speaks exactly about these relationships of power. So between this kind of precise, technical, militarized image and a dismembered, incomplete image. Um, yeah. So the next project we will briefly talk about is a self-driven project called Angels Alone. The project is a 10 minute game engine film that imagines the potential of emerging technologies such as VR and rehabilitation processes. So the project is a 10 minute game, um, sorry. Given the nature of our work, we, we are constantly thinking about the impacts of technology onto everyday life, as well as onto filmmaking itself. So we continue to explore these two tensions by using world building and storytelling to access future scenarios and critically speculate on the limits and potentials of technology. What we truly believe is that storytelling allows for us to imagine the, the reimagine the present and to be aware of the possibility 
the possible shortcomings of an overly optimistic implementation of technology in everyday life now and in the future. And um, which brings us to uh, our last project that we'll show today, which is uh, an unrealized project. Um, so Run is a side-scroller game that we imagine to be potentially guided by neural activity through a brain-computer interface. Um, so this project, we imagined it to be as part of a, a you know, part video game, part mindful meditation app. And we're trying to kind of think about new ways of, you know, accessing immersion and new potential relationships between players in open worlds. Um, and as a final remark, we wanted to kind of touch on this really important relationship between access to resources and development um, and the limitations of this access to a kind of, you know, emerging creative studio with a really small team like us. So we're still actively kind of looking for partners, specifically researchers um, that could help us implement and move the project forward. Um, and until then, we can only kind of dream of this type of immersion. Um, and yeah, so if you think you can help us with this project, please get in touch. Um, we also have three uh, exciting projects coming up. So if anyone on this chat is looking for work, please get in touch. Um, and, and yeah, follow us on Instagram. We don't have a social media strategy and we don't want to. So um, yeah, thank you. Thanks, a lot. Thanks so much. Thank you, Anna. Thanks, Ev, as well. No worries, thank you. So I'll, before, I have a lot of questions, but before that, I would like to you know, open up the floor to to other people asking questions than, than hearing myself talk. So I'll, I'll invite everybody to, to start asking questions and let's start a conversation on, on what Sabanana just showed us. Please, please try to put on your camera so that we at least oh, yeah. the speakers can see that they are speaking with, to somebody and it's not a bunch of bots. <laughs> uh, I mean, you may still be bots, but at least put cameras on. <laughs> Thanks very much. What's good cameras? Also, if you want to ask a question, um, you can either use the raise hand function in the participants tab and we can unmute you or you can post it in the chat and we can ask it on your behalf. No, no questions? Maybe Oli, you can ask yeah. the, some questions to get people warmed up. Yeah, I, I mean, I have two, one which is a simple one, but I think it's important. My sounds uh, naive, but the simple white cream, you know, and the reason I'm asking white cream is because when I look at your work, I'm wondering if that's a kind of a, let's call it business strategy, as you see yourself as the cream, as the thing on top of other people's kind of essence, or you see yourself as the underneath, basically the cream. So I'm, because it's quite interesting as, I find interesting how you take ownership of the work as you really see yourself at the moment as a plugin for studios, agencies and various artists, right? So I keep wondering how much that's intentional and kind of insisted on. Um, Do you want the honest response? Absolutely. Always. I mean, it's we're only 64 people. It's all right. Like we're all the same. <laughs> well, um, uh, well, cream actually, cream actually came from a song. I mean, yeah. we made a list of, of names that we would like, but it actually came from this Bhutan clan song, um, <laughs> which is a, an abbreviation of, a, you know, cash rules everything around me. Um, <laughs> and, and, and we thought it made sense because, you know, we are both doing other work on the side, um, small stuff, you know, um, as kind of artists that doesn't, you know, bring, bring any income streams in. And actually, when we started Cream, it was part of this way of thinking about an economical model that works um, for artists. Um, that's why it's called Cream. But uh, since then, I guess people just uh, think about nice things when they hear Cream. And that's a good thing. Um, and also, I think, yeah, I mean, in a way, 
that plugin idea makes sense. You just need a cherry on top. Got it. Yeah. Do you want to add anything to that? <laughs> I think I think I'm very much on the same page. But yeah, like when it comes to actually deciding like what you name yourself, like I think um, obviously you can spend like so much time um, deliberating on that. Um, so for us, it was just about you know quickly deciding on something that firstly you know you could find a domain name for um, <laughs> an Instagram handle um, and all these kind of really pragmatic um, factors actually, right? Yeah. Cool. Good. I'm. I'm. Yeah. I'm happy to hear that. I think there's more to talk about the kind of business plan sorts of, and I think this is why I find interesting the association of the name. But we'll let's take up the questions and we can get back to that. I think Frederick, right? Uh, Frederick has. Yeah. A question. Thank you so much. It was really nice to see a kind of summary of what you guys have been up to. Big fans, obviously. I was curious to hear how you view, I mean, you were repeating again and again that you don't have strategies for things, which I guess is, uh, is healthy in many ways, but I, obviously to some degree, everyone does. Um, but I was interesting to hear more of your, your views on your, your work, maybe what it would mean in the future and what you're going to be working on the future on a bigger perspective, especially in the light of like, I mean, people like us, we've like graduated just 10 years earlier than you working on similar ideas. And also we are now in a kind of project or process of rediscovering work that was done 15 years ago at, also at the AA by people like Stefan Dosinger and other people doing research in Second Life that is was super revolutionary. Books were released, amazing stuff and gone. No one's heard of them. And uh, so I was interested if, if like, do you see yourself kind of exploring this area like, is this what you think you will be doing? Like, I don't know how to phrase the question, but like, obviously you see kind of new releases of whatever game engines are doing now in the next year, but what about the next 15 years? I mean, this, everything is gonna be so incredibly weird and interesting. Like, do you have a perspective on kind of what your work might mean in a kind of longer time span? Um, no. But at the same time, it's like, you know, when we mentioned, you know, the work that we did for Fatherland, right, which was this kind of like surgical work that essentially meant that we were, you know, invited to kind of save the project visually as it was failing in the face of all this kind of super complicated kind of thing. Um, I guess the only plan is to proceed with caution and, you know, the only real plan is to always be critical um, about these kind of new modes of, of, you know, representation or immersion or whatever. Um, and always to keep in mind the history um, of these things. Um, but as a kind of strategy, you know, Honestly, there, there isn't, you know, we didn't sit down and thought, okay, in five years from now, we will want to have our own game developed and things like that, or we will want to have a book published. It's, it's you know, we are taking projects um, constantly and each project moves us in a completely different direction. Like the project with Sami is something that we never thought we would do actually. You know, we never we never thought we would be working with this kind of plugin and whatever, um, but we could we adapted to this kind of working you know relationship with them that we don't have with anyone else. And I think if there is one potential in kind of dealing with all this kind of tech that's emerging, is to just be really fluid about it um, and to kind of just navigate it. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but I think, um, yeah, like, I'll just, you know, to, to follow on from what Anna just said, like, there is this kind of huge emphasis on kind of world building, image making, um, and just kind of really considering um, the place that we have as like, you know, recent architecture graduates and designers to, to really contribute to this, to this space, um, working with these new technologies and just seeing where it really takes us.
maybe on the on the back of that, I can. Uh, there is a thread I uh, I was kind of putting together while you were talking about it, which is if it is to take your angels alone and the side scroller, right, as kind of the project that you start working on. And at one point, you're also mentioning about the algorithmically programmed rain. I'm wondering where do you find the excitement in in this kind of self behavior of a character, if you like, or of the environment, because I feel there's something there which you guys are trying to to define and probably kind of ties into what, what Frederick was was asking. It's like, how do you, because it's clearly you have your own interests which are being defined while kind of like, you know, do the cream part um, in collaboration. So I'm wondering if you could say a bit more about what really, what do you find there that kind of um, intrigues you? I think uh, maybe yeah, there's different things that excite us with these things. For me, uh, it's the absurdities and the complications um, that arise in kind of relating, especially to characters. Hmm. Um, you know, I mean, there's an artist at Atkins, he talks about them as corpses. Um, but, you know, I don't think they're corpses. I think they're actually kind of these living species. They're actually really human because they're scans of humans. So what really excites me is like personally is the kind of, yeah, the kind of weirdness and you know, especially, you know, what, what we showed with Fatherland when the body kind of glitches completely. Um, it kind of, you know, it kind of opens up ways of thinking of relating to these things, like like seeing eye to eye with these things. Um, and I guess in the future with Cream, I guess you, it's right. Like a lot of the work we are doing ourselves or exploring ourselves has to do with these characters. There's always a mm -hmm. character there. Um, yeah, I mean, we we kind of heavily like we're heavily and like following a lot of developments that are happening with like you know virtual virtual reality tech, mainly like you know also um, different types of like hosting solutions for like mass multiplayer open world games, like you know spatial OS that's being developed by Improbable and so on and so forth. But like I think it's really easy for us to to kind of pick too much to look at as well and it's like kind of being aware of like the technological developments but then also being really conscious about like where we where we are trying to kind of push these technologies which is in a kind of tangible um you know almost like seductive um, image which i think is something that we're we're really desperately trying to push for so i think if there's like a you know and there's no shame to say that we make kind of things that look really pretty um and that's the that's the kind of ultimate um, push forward with these technologies, right? When these things become more immersive and more um, accessible to the public, which they're not yet, right? Um, hopefully we'll be there kind of crafting um, the most visceral and visually rich environments. It's almost like attacking because one important thing that should be mentioned is, particularly with spatial OS and stuff, like it's the same tech that is kind of used by kind of governments and militarized kind of environments, right? Mm -hmm. Like the same tech that is used by, you know, through Spatial OS to do a funny game is the same tech that's being used to train soldiers, right? Um, and in a way, like, you know, I think, you know, and this also happens a lot with like machine learning where it's like, you know, you're using this technology to do something pretty, but then in turn, you're kind of like advancing the technology. Um, that that can then be used by, you know, who knows who, but um, so I guess it's funny, like m maybe the, the kind of the aesthetics of what we're pushing, I think they kind of speak to that in a way. Maybe it's in, in, a, in an ironic sense sometimes, but it's like, it's the same aesthetics that, you know, the kind of clean Apple kind of vibe. Polished, uh, yeah, yeah. Polished vibe that is emerging. Um, and, you know, I think through the subtleties of the narratives or the storytelling or whatever, we can kind of turn that around. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's good you're mentioning about entertainment, actually, because there is a, there is a question from Bastien Lefebvre. 
which says, could you talk about your position on entertainment? As you were talking a lot about video games and photography as inspiration, I also felt like the way things are being built in the virtual modeling realm, similar to cinema production, I think that's probably the second question, which goes, do you think of your work and virtual worlds in general in the future to move towards a new form of cinema slash entertainment? Um, video games are already a new form of cinema. Um, and the kind of video game industry has taken over in the entertainment industry. Um, but I think the problem with cinema is, yeah, it's exactly that you know, it's part of this kind of capitalist machine, right? And entertainment as well, it's kind of there to be consumed. It's a kind of consumer-based thing. Now, as kind of artists, I think if we look around us, the two kind of worlds start to kind of converge. Uh, there is not that distinction between, you know, the avant-garde and the cinema, right? Um, so I am personally really critical of this thing that is happening with video games and, you know, video game tools because they speak like, you know, they speak of, you know, capitalism. There's no way they don't speak of that. But at the same time, I guess, I guess that's the position. But in terms of our work, it would be, you know, it'd be kind of, you know, um, how do I say this? But, you know, we can't, you know, I can't promise you that we wouldn't fall for that, right? Um, that we wouldn't end up entertaining. Um, it's just a matter of like how that happens, right? Mm -hmm. And what are the kind of subtle messages or critiques towards that, that we kind of bring into our project. Um, I have a question. Um, what about the application beyond entertainment? So the last two projects you showed, we're looking at applying kind of VR technology into um, co like different contexts, such as like prisons, or um, you were talking about in the realm of mindfulness. And so where do you see Cream intervening um, to kind of take this beyond like entertainment? And actually, how do you test it in different contexts to change something about how they currently op operate. Yeah, um, I think, you know, obviously we have we have those kind of like grand ambitions of like, you know, really bringing about like positive change to like certain um, social groups or, you know, different types of like audiences that like would require, um, you know, virtual tech to enable themselves to you know, exist in worlds beyond you know what they're able to currently experience, and like I think you know a lot of these you know just just to, to name a few like instances you know we've got psychological treatment we've got you know, training and a lot of these like really um, utilitarian like virtual applications that are being rolled out, um, but at the same time we're aware that like you know we're still relatively young um and in order for people to take us more seriously um when it comes to more serious forms of content um we actually would need to build up a, a solid track record of delivering projects in a much smaller scale first um and then also building up these projects in parallel um in order to potentially get there um i don't know i mean it's it's like difficult to to say but yeah i mean we're using all of our free time to, to really think about these applications and, and to try and push, um, yeah, like just different ways of thinking about the technology, um, whether it's, you know, whether we're actually like really proposing like a, a, a rehabilitation program in prison or just putting it together as a scenario in order for people to, to understand what that reality would look like. Um, so I think, you know, there's also this idea of like just literally um, storytelling and, you know, stimulating um, and provoking that sort of thinking in people. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. 
Uh, no, there's just a link, a related question in oh. the chat. Um, so uh, Robin asks that, um, you know, what are your views on using game development tools out of the hands of larger institutions through a refiguring of space, location and cost? So how do you, as a small studio, kind of question the power structures that are kind of dominating the way this technology is accessed? Yeah, I mean, again, like, it's one of the most important problems, I think, that are happening right now. Um, I see it in a lot of my artist friends who are also coders and, you know, they all end up working for some like famous artist in the back, you know, and, you know. Um, so I think that's a really solid question. I'm not, it's what we're trying to figure out as well. Um, is just such a kind of unbreakable tie between like the amounts of resources needed to develop something um, and, you know, the kind of institutional power required to do that. Um, it reminds me of, you know, like the artist Hito Staro, she once said that, you know, these kind of new kind of technological projects, you know, developed through big institutions, you know, it's kind of like doping in sports. Um, and, and, but at the same time, you know, there is a true hope or promise of some sort of like self driven kind of way of dealing with, with these projects. It's already happening with like, you know, gaming platforms like Minecraft, right. Where like you can build your own game and, you know, you can kind of sell access to that and kind of, or Roblox, where you're kind of literally kind of building games for other people to play, and then you convert that money back to your account. So there's start, you know, there are glimmers of, of hope in that. But I think, you know, there should be a time, and maybe this is one of the projects that we should start, um, to kind of figure out that kind of diagram of how we can make this work and how we can make kind of self-user generated work outside the institution. I think Erika Statnik had raised her hand and I managed to turn her off yeah, unwillingly. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so if you want to ask a question, Erika? Yeah, cool. I think, Hi. yeah, I'm unmuted. Um, hi, so I have a question. Um, so when you think of like 100 years from now, or at a point where we have chips in our brains that create the virtual reality rather than like external devices and when it all kind of works really well. And when you think of all the glitches that exist now and like, obviously you like to pinpoint the glitches and I notice them a lot. Um, how do you kind of see in a hundred years people looking back at these glitches that are happening now and like at your work and like, uh, what's just generally the reality of now? And do you ever kind of ponder on like how fleeting now is um, and how significant is it now? And, or, or will we just forget these, these moments of when it didn't really work and just uh, exist in the, in the future then? I mean, it's the same thing like with printers, right? Like printers, haven't changed forever, but mine keeps jamming every other day. And, you know, like our computer just collapsed five minutes before this presentation. So I think I, you know, the, I think glitches will always be there. It's a kind of self perfect, perfecting thing. Um, and, and, you know, reality glitches sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, if you want to add anything to that. No, I mean, I think, I think, yeah, like we're definitely at like a premature stage with like VR, even though it's been like, you know, commercially rolled out for like the last five to six years. Um, but then everyone, I think the companies even admit that like these technologies are actually meant to, to prepare us for like what they believe to be kind of augmented reality glasses that would be good enough for us to actually use productivity like you know with, with productivity and, and so on and so forth so i do think that like yeah maybe maybe a lot of technologies literally just get um yeah just rolled out in order to just prepare us somehow um 
and at the same time, like I feel like the glitches that we that we experience now are are, are just kind of um, they're actually not as bad as they they could potentially be um, in like you know 20, 30 years when we start to roll in more tech into the situation, right? So I'm just gonna give you a rough example that like, you know, right now we've just got one VR headset, um, maybe some speakers and some uh, some headphones and then some controllers, right? So what happens when we have haptic suits and haptic gloves and, you know, even like treadmills that we like run, run on at home, like all these things could potentially just like screw up um, on like literally uh, any second, right? So I think, yeah, it's it's difficult to say. Maybe yeah, we we will look back, and you know we have looked back as well, like at VR in the '80s and '90s, like when NASA was like playing around with it, and like looking at um, some of the applications that that they were making, which were like you know laughable at this point, but you know we still kind of look to them really romantically somehow. Mm. And do you think it will develop? Um, it will develop at a similar rate. Um, that we will be able to notice this point or or do like so so that we will be able to see this point now as we see the NASA experiments or it will it will be much more kind of like jump together these points of development now and in the future that it will be harder to like pinpoint each moment yeah I mean it's 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 difficult for me to say because like I don't work in like um kind of hardware development. Um, so I'm not really like on the inside loop, right? In terms of like how, what, what's happening and what people are developing. But I can, I can truly say that like, you know, you probably noticed as well, like if you look at it really carefully that within the last four or five years, like all these technologies that have been like simultaneously developed, like sensors and you know, higher like, you know, OLED screens and all these different things have just so happened to collide and uh, form VR, right, as we know it. So if we think about 2015 until now, like a lot of these technologies actually haven't, you know, they've, they've almost reached that, that peak, you know? So we're waiting for that new, like, I don't know, renaissance of like different tech innovations to occur before like, you know, something you know, before it actually takes form as like, a, as you know, as elegant as the iPhone and how we use the iPhone now. Because mm. um, a lot of people compare like the brick phone period to what we're experiencing with VR right now. Mm. Um, so I don't know, I mean, yeah, perhaps I think like you just need almost the synergy of like different resources to collide and make way for like a new way of thinking about it. I guess uh, I just want to add one more thing to that, though, is that there is this really solid theory about kind of the limits of computation, like just as the same as a human kind of can run up to a certain point, and there's a limit to that. Um, you know, I think there is a chance where like literally the limits of computation will be reached. Um, and I mean, this comes from mathematics and physics, you know, and black holes and all that. But, you know, something to consider is the possibility of this just reaching its peak at some point. Um, yeah. Cool. Thanks. Frederick, I think he, he raised a hand. There are also some um, Good questions in the chat. If you want to, I, I can just jump in, uh, leading on from what Erica was talking about. Um, I'd be curious to hear your attitude towards the fact that like our practices largely relies on whatever tech companies work on and build on. And in some cases, I'm sure you feel the same. At least we feel quite often like, are we just at the mercy of of whatever these companies are doing, and are we just kind of Whenever something new comes up, we we lose our minds and we just get on working with that just because we're excited. And I think especially in art practices, it's never really been seen before. I mean, if you look at kind of golden age painters that were kind of 
running around trying to build more effective optical tools and keeping them secret so that it's not comparable at all. So have you got an I a kind of how do you think it would be healthy and good to continue working with this and being kind of obviously you work with the stuff that is as cutting edge as you can possibly muster your work is really advanced like for being a small practice it's seriously advanced but if you had more resources i'm sure you wouldn't stop yourself from just building new things and working closer with the tech industry and and being the first and being the kind of uh, not necessarily that that's the aim but that's just sort of what happens when you work with with these kind of new technologies and i mean we are constantly questioning if uh, we're doing it the right way or if we should rethink our approach to working with these new tools how do you how do you see this how do you think about that in your practice yeah i think i think you probably said it quite right like th there's always um there's always that desire right to to kind of collaborate with more interesting people like obviously anna and i we, we already have like a small network of like you know software programmers and um you know, specialist kind of 3D people that come onto the projects from time to time. But like, I think something that we joke about quite a lot is how maybe our role in, in this space is to actually like slow things down a lot um, and to be the kind of annoying like pair that just like refuses to pick up digital photography um, <laughs> and kind of continues doing things as analog as possible, even though we're working with kind of cutting edge tools. So there, there is like a like a weird parallel there. And I think like maybe it's not so much about accelerating the tech, um, but more using what's available to actually just do something quite human or, you know, just <clears throat> rela relatable, you know? But at the same time, it's that thing that we talked about earlier. It's first, to be aware of the kind of history of what you're dealing with, both on the tech side and on the kind of kind of visual representation side, and to just tread really carefully. I mean, you know, none of the projects that we started start from, you know, oh, let's use this tech, you know, like wh which tech can we use now? It's always a conversation about film and photography and, you know, like references that come outside of, of the kind of gaming industry. And if we were ever kind of scaling up, um, and that is something actually to talk about because, you know, we're really, we really don't want to scale up. We're really interested in that limit that would allow us to not kind of fall for, fall for it, you know? Um, so yeah, it's just a matter of just really being aware of what you're doing constantly. Yeah. Um, no, but at the same time, like, yeah, I think, I think like we are really like, cons you know, just thinking about different ways of like um, representing the work, different outputs, um, how things can be packaged up in, you know, more interactive ways. Um, and yeah, that, that all kind of comes with the, the advancement of these sort of technologies, right? So um, obviously, you know, I, I get really excited whenever um, Unreal Engine Oh. Oh. Lost focus. <laughs> but yeah, I get really excited whenever Unreal Engine releases um, their latest kind of documentation, you know, even on like a fortnightly basis, it seems like they're like really kind of making just groundbreaking stuff, right? And I think to follow that journey is just like really exciting. Um, and also, yeah. But maybe to bridge that into Shimon's question about um, the Uncanny Valley and the Unreal releases. So we spent a lot of time, you know, because Unreal 5 came out and it was like a big, well, it won't be, it's coming out soon and they released this thing, this kind of promo video. And then we went um, on Reddit and you know other spaces and found people that are already working with it with a kind of early release. And, you know, the, and the Uncanny Valley is kind of getting even more uh, obvious as they advance, you know, as they get into ray tracing, as they, you know, as the technology advances, like the uncanny valley gets more and more and more obvious. 
um, for, for which reason, like we already kind of decided that we might not actually use Unreal 5 when no. it comes out, um, simply because it's kind of, it generates this images that are completely first, they're completely out of our hands. They come with this aesthetic that is just increasingly disturbing. Um, so it's just a matter of, of being aware. I don't think like Uncanny Valley will go anytime soon. I think you'll just get more and more perfected, like mm -hmm. until maybe someone just comes out of the screen and talks to us. No, but just real quickly, like I think um, like a lot of the best games out there, um, you know, the ones that really move us, right? Like Journey or, or Inside. Um, they're, they're like the games that really have, you know, in terms of graphics are uh, not necessarily super photorealistic, but um, kind of bring together a set of imagery that is highly relatable. So as long as we kind of push towards that, I think, I think that's genuinely the, the path that we would like to go down. I guess. Yeah, I guess that that comment also leads to um, to a question that I I have for you, since you've been working with lots of different uh, professionals in this field. Is to what extent do you think architecture profession has something to add to, whether it's storytelling or what other professionals do already in the gaming industry? How do you think uh, that? architects are adding something to that game or do you actually think there's a possibility of saying hang on that installation that game was done by architects somehow they added this this and that that nobody else would have done if architects wouldn't be there is that do you actually think there's something extra that you are adding as architects okay. yeah, yeah um i think the the thing that we've discovered um as architects working in this kind of build is that contrary to the ways in which other studios work through this kind of really specialized work stack, right? Where you have your like, you know, mesh person, you have your rigor, you have your texture, you have your colorist and they all work together. As architects, we're inevitably generalists. So we know a bit of everything, right? Uh, we might not do the best rig of a really complicated bird, but we, we are in control of how we want that bird to look and the space in which it is, you yeah. know, and the wider consideration and we're always of trying, the project. We're always trying to squeeze more and more. <laughs> so in that well. sense... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so in that sense, like, I think we, we do have something to add. Maybe not, like, as architects, architects, but as someone, yeah. as, you know, in our case, as people that went to the AA and, you know, we learned how to think about systems and large problems, you know? Yeah, but I think like, you know, just on a really pragmatic level, like why people come to us as opposed to like a, you know, a 3D studio or like, you know, people that have like specialist degrees in like computer graphics and so on is because, yeah, we, you know, the AA and the culture of the AA has this, um, has really made a, an impression on us. And I think that's that's how we kind of, exists really um, by thinking really laterally and thinking really um, just, you know, with the larger picture in mind all the time. Um, so, you know, it's not so much about creating anything that already exists, but but to really think of things that um, could potentially still happen, right? Okay. Uh, well, well, thanks a lot, really. Uh, I think we can... Uh, wrap up um, and well, first of all, ask you if you can leave your contact details in the chat. I think uh, some may actually want to contact you later on. I think it would be good if you leave those oh, yeah. contacts. And definitely, well, thank you for coming. Uh, for uh, Thank everybody else for coming to the this event, the lecture series. Just as a small reminder, next week we have another event, Emerging Intelligences, uh, Cristobal Valenzuela, Emmanuel Co, and Jeffrey Huang. In this case, more about generative 
algorithms and architectural design. Um, so I uh, hope to see everybody there. Uh, and uh, I think we can leave it on here. Thanks a lot, everyone, for coming. I'll just get everyone to do a mass unmute so that we can give you a round of applause. Oh, oh yes. It's <laughs> OK. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> I love that. I love that. <laughs> <laughs>